Mayo. Thank you all for, for joining. Um, I have wanted to do this talk for about four years now. I am very happy to finally get around to putting it together. I am even happier to have Dr. Paul Quo join me for this presentation as director of hepatology, a super experienced principal investigator and a member of several BSMBs, his perspective on this topic would be invaluable. Unfortunately, he's currently with a patient, but he will join us a little later, just in time for Q&A and to present some case studies. So we'll be joining us, I promise. Um, I will review today uh, identification and classification of adverse events, the team responsibilities within the site, how the information flows from the investigator and to whom, reporting timelines, and then case studies will be presented by Dr. Quo. In between each section, I'm gonna pause for questions because I know there's a lot of information there and I think some of it is um, pretty heavy. So I will call for questions a lot. Uh, so please feel free to unmute, unmute when I do that and just ask your questions as they come. There will be polls interspersed uh, at the end of each section as well. So be ready for that as well. As a bit of an introduction, and as I'm sure you all know, properly and promptly managing adverse events is a critical safety protection for research participants. Adverse events must be documented and tracked and under certain conditions reported to sponsors, regulatory agencies, and IRBs. They can result in physical and psychological harms and affect economic or social well-being. They occur in biomedical, especially therapeutic interventions, social and behavioral research. But as the name suggests, for this talk, I'm just going to be covering drugs. Why, <laughs> you may ask, uh, just because it's a lot of information with drugs, and I think it's the basis for everything. Once you have that down, the nuances of device adverse events can be easily adjusted to. So this is the basis for everything. There are many similar and confusing definitions in this domain of adverse events. The purpose of this talk is not to cover all of them at all. This is the review of the minimal possible um, uh, ad, uh, definitions that are adequate to understand the appropriate reporting requirements. So again, a heads up, I'm not gonna cover all of them. Starting with the stakeholders, there is the sponsor, the investigator, and the sponsor investigator. Uh, I'm sure you all know, but just wanted to make sure that we are speaking the same language. So the sponsor is the entity or the individual who takes responsibility for and initiates the clinical investigation. Investigator is the individual who actually conducts the clinical investigation. Sponsor investigator both initiates and conducts the investigation. And I'm not gonna be actually mentioning DSMV or DMCs, um, but their, their presence is sort of looming <laughs> uh, over this presentation. So I just wanted to, to define that as well. An independent group of experts whose primary responsibilities are to periodically review and evaluate the accumulated study data for participant safety, study conduct and progress, and when appropriate efficacy, and to make recommendations concerning continuation, modification, or termination of the trial. Um, other stakeholders are, of course, FDA, IRB, and the site study. Starting with the basic adverse events, any untoward medical occurrence that happens during uh, participation in clinical research, whether or not it is considered to be related to that participation in the research. In contrast, adverse reaction is an adverse event that is caused by a drug. Now in the world of clinical research, we rarely deal with this certainty of, yes, it was caused by the drug. We usually deal with a suspected adverse reaction which is an adverse event for which there is a reasonable possibility that the drug caused the event. And there's a clarification. Reasonable possibility means that there is evidence to suggest a causal relationship between the drug and the adverse event. And I will, you will keep hearing me say, talk about this evidence, because it's important to, to remember that evidence is required. 
Um, to make it more succinct, adverse events may or may not be related to the study drug, may or may not be related to the study participation. Suspected adverse reaction, there is a reasonable possibility that the drug caused the AE. To make it even more succinct, the difference is causality. That's the difference between the two. Pretty much. Um, we'll go to, the, to our first poll just to check what you know about serious adverse events. And I see that the numbers are, oh, no, they're still going. <laughs> Once they stop moving, I'll, I'll share the results. But, or Susan will share the results. But people are still voting. I think it's okay to share now, Susan. Okay, so none of the above. So, let me review the question, sorry. Which of the following outcomes would not be considered an um, an SAE or a serious adverse event. Uh, the winner is none of the above, uh, which means the death, a life-threatening adverse event, hospitalization, significant, significant or persistent, inc persistent incapacity, congenital anomaly, and important medical event um, would be considered to be a uh, serious adverse event. So let's review the actual, um, let me close this. Uh, let's review what it is. So serious adverse events are any, it's any adverse event that would result in any of the following outcomes. Death, a life-threatening adverse event, inpatient hospitalization or prolongation of existing hospitalization, persistent or significant incapacity, or congenital anomaly or birth defect. And other important medical events may also be considered serious when, based upon appropriate medical judgment, they may jeopardize the participant and may require medical or surgical intervention to prevent one of the outcomes listed above. Examples for that would be allergic bronchospasm requiring intensive treatment in an emergency room or at home, convulsions that do not result in inpatient hospitalization, or development of drug dependency or drug abuse. So all of those would be examples for an other important medical event that would still be con considered as a serious adverse event. So all of you who chose the none of the above were correct. Moving on. Serious adverse event, um, the seriousness is related to the, the outcome as you could, could tell from the definition, and it would determine the regulatory reporting of the event. Severity, on the other hand, is a, major, is a measure of intensity. It may be used in event coding or grading to describe the intensity of a specific symptom or condition, uh, but it is not a regulatory definition. CTCAE is a very common grading system. It is used primarily in cancer studies. Those of you who are using the Cancer Encore instance are, are uh, used to seeing it there. Um, it is a very common grading system. Another common grading system is the Division of AIDS grading system that is used by infectious diseases. This is an example for grading of vomiting. Severity can be used as a quantitative guide for the determination of seriousness. For example, if I'm just putting the essays as a reminder, 
you can see that a grade three severe, a protocol can say if a grade three severe vomiting that requires aggressive, because it requires aggressive rehydration, qualifies as an other important medical event. And of course, the grade four, potentially life threatening, is also life threatening. So a protocol can say grades three and four of vomiting are serious. And that can make your life a little easier <laughs> with the determination of seriousness. But the relationship is not always obvious. And don't, don't count on it unless the protocol specifically says that you should. Uh, many, but not all SAEs are severe, but many severe a adverse events do not satisfy the regulatory definition of serious. So just keep that in mind. The next definition has to do with um, the event being expected or unexpected uh, for the drug. Basically, if it's not written in the investigation or brochure or the protocol for the drug, it is not expected. Uh, now there are sort of levels of details that come under it. If it's not listed at the, at the exact severity observed or the exact specificity observed, it will still be considered to be unexpected. For example, if the investigator brochure says, um, we are expecting to see elevated hepatic enzymes and you see hepatic necrosis, the observation, you, you have observed it in a greater severity, so it's unexpected. Uh, same for specificity. Um, and then another thing, even if it's written in the investigation or brochure that it is expected for the drug class but has not been observed for the specific drug yet, it would still be unexpected for the drug if you see it. Finally, if you anticipate it for the disease under investigation or for the population being treated, but it's not, but not for the drug, it is still unexpected. I'm pausing here for a second to make sure that I didn't confuse you. <laughs> uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and let me know. Maya, could you um, um, just go over your first example about elevated hepatic enzymes versus cirrhosis in the CTCA? Yeah, so I didn't say cirrhosis, uh, but oh, yeah, I'll, okay. I'll go over that. So, uh, um, so if the severity described in the investigation or brochure is uh, elevated hepatic enzymes, which would suggest some type of liver damage of liver cellular damage. Uh, but, and that's, that's the level of severity that is described in the investigation of brochure. But what you are seeing is hepatic necrosis, which is a very a much uh, more severe level of cellular injury for the liver. So it's a greater severity of those elevated hepatic enzymes. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you for clarifying. Okay, sure. Um, moving on. Yeah, there, there is a chat question. Um, uh, will we have access? Oh, sorry. Um, that's, um, sorry. Um, that one said, uh, um, there was a question and then she said um, that she sees uh, the first point. Never mind. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, okay. So the combination of all of those definitions, suspected adverse reaction, that is serious and unexpected. Uh, this is sort of the, the holy grail of what we search for, for the purpose of regulatory reporting. These are the SUSARs, serious and unexpected suspected adverse, adverse reactions. Uh, these are the ones that would uh, require immediate reporting to, and I will cover this later on, but these are the ones that we are actually um, uh, actively looking for during the study. We're recording everything, but we, we are looking for these. Um, while SUSARs are the major entity of concern within the sphere of adverse events, I did want to mention another animal <laughs> you may encounter uh, called AC. 
Uh, those are adverse events of special interest. Those are um, events or symptoms that are thought to be potentially associated with an investigation of compound or with a disease um, that they have scientific medical concerns that are um, for which ongoing monitoring and rapid communication are needed by the sponsor. It, is, it will be specified in the protocol. Be on the lookout for those. They can be serious or non-serious. I'm just giving you as an example hair loss, loss of taste, uh, things like that that you may not consider them, that they would not necessarily be serious, but sponsor would still like to know about them uh, in an expedited manner. So be on the lookout for those as well. Um, this is a little bit of a poll, I have a little bit of a poll. This is a poll with three questions uh, to test uh, how much of what I just threw at you uh, has sunk in. So uh, definitions, poll. Good luck. I should have picked some music <laughs> for those quiet uh, voting signs. I'll do that for next time. You can always. Numbers are still going up. <laughs> I heard somebody say you can always sing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess we can stop. Yeah, yeah, it's slowing down. Yeah. Okay. So I'll share the results. Okay. So the first question: determining the causality or relatedness of the AE to the study drug is a critical step in determining. Yes, sixty-two percent got it right. If the event is a suspected drug reaction, meaning if the event if there is reasonable possibility that the event is related to the drug. Um, second question, if an event is anticipated for the disease being treated, but not listed as expected for the study drug in the investigational brochure, it is classified as expected. Absolutely correct that it's false. <laughs> okay. Um, ooh, okay. So this is a multiple choice. What are the components of a SUSAR? Uh, there are, remember, there were three components. It has to be serious, suspected adverse reaction, and an unexpected 
and an unexpected uh, adverse event. I think maybe the phrasing that I used made it kind of uh, hard to understand what I was. Uh, but I will show this slide uh, right after this again to, to make sure that I didn't end up confusing you more. Um, because I think this is the one that got you confused. Anyway, thank you. So I will just go back to this one to show you again. Here, so suspected adverse reaction that is an unexpected adverse event and a serious adverse event. So, um, yeah, that's that was the spirit of the question. I guess I didn't write it well. Moving on, um, identification and classification of adverse events. Uh, it is a critically important step in determining how we record them, report them, and to whom. So I'm gonna start with a quick question, very quick. Which is the hardest to determine um, of all the three components that I covered? Seriousness, relatedness, or expectedness? What do you think? And I think we can stop, Susan. Um, I think it's pretty clear. <laughs> yes. So uh, the majority went with relatedness, which is the correct choice. Uh, causality or relatedness is the one that's most, uh, that's the hardest to determine. Um, Factors that you would want to consider when evaluating causality are a temporal relationship between drug administration and adverse events, a dose relationship between the occurrence or the severity of the adverse events, what you see on beach challenge or re-challenge with a drug, is there a recognized association with a class of the drug, is there even a pharmacological plausibility that the drug can cause this adverse event? What is the underlying illness or concurrent conditions that can uh, support this adverse event or not? And other medications taken. Of course, the quality of the information is always critical. But even with all of this in mind, it is really hard to determine uh, causality. And they tend to be over overreported. Until 2011, the regulations um, talked about that talked about reporting SUSARs, they said, uh, report, immediately report serious, unexpected adverse events that are associated with use of the drug. And that was just too vague. Many interpreted this as conservatively as possible and reported events when they could not rule out an association, meaning that they pretty much reported every serious adverse event, uh, because not being able to rule out something is Everything is reportable almost under under that umbrella. Um, and that meant that FDA investigators and IRBs were inundated with safety reports that had no real actionable value. Um, they were labor intensive and created a, a lot of noise. From 2011 on, expediting reporting of SUSARs should only occur in the regulations. If there is evidence, and I told you I would speak about this evidence, to suggest a causal relationship between the drug and the adverse event. Um, and the regulations went further to, to give examples of categories of events that should be reported after a single occurrence of, of the event, events that should be reported after just a few occurrences, and events that should not be reported until you have done an aggregate analysis of, of an entire group or, or, and compared between groups. So the first example they provided is a single occurrence of an event that is uncommon and is known to be strongly associated with drug exposure. For example, angioedema, liver damage, 
Stevens-Johnson syndrome, rhabdomyolysis, anaphylaxis. For those events, unless you have a clear indication for your specific patient that something else is the cause, you can feel com very comfortable reporting it as related or potentially related to the study drug. Um, so that's, um, that's an easy one, sort of. The next category, category B, is for events that are not commonly associated with drug exposure and are also not common for the population uh, that is exposed to the drug. A really good example is MI in young women. One of those cases may not be enough, but a few are a good enough indication that it's possibly the drug. They are saying that a single case may be sufficient if you have this very clear temporal association or you can see clear recurrence or on rechallenge. But usually you would need those few occurrences um, to say that, yes, I suspect that the drug is causing the event. And then finally, the, the third category, category C, is the, ones where, is the one where an actual aggregate analysis is required uh, before you can actually make any determination about causality. Uh, these would usually, you would see those when the underlying disease or the condition under investigation or even um, something that would commonly occur in the population under study uh, can also be a cause for those adverse events. Clear example, MI in, in the population of the elderly, where you really can't tell from one or even a few that it's caused by the drug or, or not. Uh, for those, you would need to do, to, to do an aggregate analysis before you can make any determination. And I'm sharing this example because it's, it's relevant to our current reality. This is from a recent FDA guidance on the conduct of clinical trials in the times of COVID. Uh, it has a pretty hefty <laughs> Q&A section. And one of the questions is exactly about this. So the question is, we are running a clinical trial. It's not investigating COVID treatment. But we have participants that are diagnosed with COVID and experience SAEs that are associated with COVID-19, for example, pulmonary embolism. Uh, should that be reported as a SUSAR? And that's exactly a really good example for category C. Their FDA's response was, of course, participants with COVID-19 may experience SAEs that are associated with COVID-19 and are not causally related to the drug that you're studying. However, the drug that you're studying may make those participants more susceptible to complications from COVID-19. How can you tell? Not by a one event, not by three or four. You would need to do the aggregate analysis and compare between groups, between the treatment groups and between a control, either concurrent, historical, whatever data you have. You would need to do that before you can see a suggestion <laughs> for a causal relationship. And once you find that causal relationship, that's when you report. So yeah, that's my example, my relevant example. Finally, you have probably seen those scales for determining causality. Uh, how sure are you that it's related? There's the WHO of certain probable, likely possible. Um, there are some other variations. Uh, and then there's the binary, related, not related. Uh, in general, uh, there are difficulties to differentiate between scales with four or more levels. Uh, there is poor inter-rater agreement using terms such as possible or probable, but it, it's hard to, to differentiate. Um, and grades of causality offer little practical advantages. What you need to know is do you need to report it or do you not need to report it? So really, if you can, if you have a say in it, just use the binary scales. That's the, the overall recommendation to date. Um, and I'm, I'm talking so much about this because 10, year, 10 years after the regulations changed, uh, we have this quote. FDA says that 86% of sponsor reports of SUSARs in a recent oncology trial did not meet the criteria for reporting to the agency. Uh, and again, that's noise. 
that that detracts from from the, the important information. Uh, so, when in doubt, as an investigator, as a sponsor, investigator report. As an industry sponsor, take the time to think <laughs> of what you're reporting, and don't flood sites and IRBs and everyone else with reports that have no meaning. Sorry, that's just my personal um, point of view that I feel very, very strongly about. Moving on, uh, who does what? I'm gonna start with a quick couple of questions. Poll for Susan. <laughs> I think we can, uh, yeah. Okay, so who can determine if an A is serious and life-threatening? The winner is both, and it's the same for who can determine if an ASE is related to the city drive. Let's see about that. Uh, that's, this is gonna be interesting. Um, sponsor versus investigator. Determining if an event is serious and is life-threatening, you were right. Either the investigator or the sponsor can make that determination. Determining if event is related to the study drug per FDA, the sponsor is the one to make the final determination. So of course the investigator is expected to make their own determination and submit it to the sponsor, but the final determination is in the sponsor's hands. They can overrule what the investigator says. Um, however, ICH E2A, either the investigator or the sponsor can make that final determination. I'm curious to hear what you think about that. So please unmute and let me know your thoughts about this because this is cool. Or not? I think it's it gets um, really confusing for individuals to think about this because I mean I always <clears throat> what I had learned way back in the day is that if the investigator makes a determination and the sponsor disagrees, the investigator can still report it to the FDA dire directly outside of the sponsor. I don't know why my picture's not there anymore. Oh, <laughs> you're back. Computer. There I am. <laughs> I'm looking at the wrong uh, screen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, we also have I, it I'm in not the sure. chat I don't... that it's biased. Susan, what were you saying? I was saying that uh, we also have it in the chats that they are saying uh, it's biased and uh, people are agreeing with that. <laughs> that the investigator should have the same say. Yes. Okay. So I think, well, I don't think, um, the, the argument behind letting the sponsor make the final determination is that they have an overview of everything that's happening, not just with all the sites, but with all the other studies with that compound. So they would have more information uh, to support, um, to support a, a more informed 
decision or determination of relatedness. That's what. Uh, they will, I mean, if they determine that it's not related, I think, I believe that the investigator, I, I have not seen this and I don't know, I, I, I think I saw Psalm's name in here. <laughs> if you want to add, if you know something, uh, I think the investigator can uh, report directly. I have not heard of something like that. Uh, if there are concerns, uh, but I do want to want you to want to know, they want you to know that the investigators report and their determination is recorded with the sponsor. And that is still being analyzed and that is still being compiled. And if more and more assessments come, the time will come where the sponsor will say, okay, now it makes sense. Now I see that it's related. So that's to me, my, my logic of saying the sponsor has a more informed view uh, to make that determination. However, as you can see, ICH thinks that either one can make that determination. So it is, it is interesting and it is, um, um, I know I've heard, I've just this week, I attended a webinar about uh, adverse event reporting in pre preparation for this talk where sites within the U.S. complain that if they're getting reports from international studies, they're, being, they're getting too many reports uh, that would not cut it <laughs> if they were just for FDA. So I don't know. Food for thought. Uh, anything else in the chat, Susan? That there is one comment that says a sponsor can upgrade but not downgrade relatedness. It's the they industry. They can experience. downgrade. Yeah, they can downgrade. They can they, overrule. My um, that so it's Elizabeth. I, that's just my direct experience. Is when I was in industry, we could we could upgrade it but not down. So I've seen there are recommendations that they should only upgrade and there are yeah. articles that but it's not yeah. the regulation it's a slippery itself slope. <laughs> allows them. Yeah, the regulations themselves allows them to go either way. But I agree with you that um, it's uh, uh, most would probably not. Um, OK, moving on. Investigator versus research team. All members of the research team who interact with participants must have, of course, sufficient training on the protocol to be able to recognize, document, and report when appropriate AEs are directly observed, um, when, are, when they are documented in patient records, and when they are reported by the participants during their interactions with them. The investigator is the one responsible and accountable to ensure that necessary clinical management of AEs is carried out, to make final determination regarding relatedness of the event to the investigation product and or to the research, seriousness of the event and if applicable, severity, to document in real time and to ensure that events are assessed in a timely manner that supports the regulatory reporting requirements. Investigator may delegate some or all clinical management and determination responsibilities to other qualified researchers that are involved with the study. Those qualifications, of course, must be documented and the investigator remains ultimately accountable. I think we are all aware of that. Uh, I have two questions about delegations, what you can and cannot delegate, uh, and then we're moving on to the next section.
I think we can share that one, Susan. So, yeah, all of those um, activities um, can be shared with qualified and trained CRC or CRM. Um, I don't think I need to, to read those. We can go to the next poll. I think we can stop sharing. Okay, um, so the majority, although a smaller majority, got it right. Uh, when it comes to determining um, relatedness, <laughs> seriousness, severity, um, the CRC CRM should not be delegated to do that. And that is specifically, we're talking about drug studies right now. Uh, there are other <laughs> types of trials where training uh, may be, uh, may apply and you can, but for now, as an overall blanket statement, this is the one that would cover all uh, contingencies. Um, I want to show you, this is an example from a protocol. The determination of seriousness, severity, and causality will be made by an on-site investigator who is qualified. And they clarify here that meant, that means licensure <laughs> to diagnose AE information, provide a medical evaluation of AEs, and classify AEs based upon medical judgment. This includes but is not limited to physicians, physician assistants, and nurse practitioners. So again, depending on the study, this can be expanded. It can be a chiropractor, it can be a physical therapist, it can be um, a dentist, it can be, um, or it can be, but it, it really does depend on the study. And as a, the assumption should be, no, you cannot delegate this to CRC um, unless there's a good argument to be made. But let's assume that you can. Um, Okay, moving on. So I'm putting my foot in my mouth right now. <laughs> uh, the flow of information of reporting. So who generally reports to whom? The investigator will report to the IRB and the sponsor. The sponsor is the one who reports to the FDA and to the investigator. Sponsor investigator reports to everyone else or everyone because they're both. So this is what it looks like this really nice diagram. And these are the timelines for reporting. I'm dividing this to immediately reportable adverse events and uh, periodically reportable. And I'm mostly gonna concentrate on the immediately reportable. Uh, SAEs to sponsor. I put IRB in, in a shaded gray because uh, some some IRBs are still asking for it. SUSARs to FDA, SUSARs to investigators, and then SUSARs or un unexpected serious adverse reactions to IRB. Um, and I will go over them one by now, but one by now, one by one now. <laughs> okay. SAEs to sponsors to sponsor needs to be reported immediately. FDA recognizes this immediately as a day for the, this allowed time. Uh, 
to cover immediate reporting to the sponsor. Uh, the sponsor usually will provide the exact timeline in the protocol. I have not seen anything different than 24 hours, but you may have seen something different. Um, SAEs to IRBs. I have not had the pleasure <laughs> or dubious pleasure of working with an IRB that wanted immediate reporting of SAEs, but I heard that they do exist. Uh, so just putting it out there, uh, some would want uh, immediate reporting of SAEs or maybe just SAEs that result in a life-threatening or death, but usually they would only require periodic reporting of SAEs. Talking about reporting, immediate reporting of SAEs, how do you immediately become aware of SAEs in your site? So this is something, what do you do with you know, three weeks of winter closure, uh, holidays, weekends? Uh, I know, so how do you become, how do you make sure that you are aware of those as soon as possible? So I know CCTO has a hotline that goes to senior CRC or CRM for triage. Uh, you can have a group email that good, just goes to someone who's on call and to, to, to someone who's, and then just forward it to whoever needs to know and escalate it. And I do, I do know that you can add it to care, you can add yourself to the care team in ethics. Uh, so you are notified if the participant is hospitalized. Now that, I don't know if everyone can do that or if that is specific to certain groups uh, that can do that. I'm just, I'm aware that it is, that it can be done uh, for some but I don't know more about this than I am I'm saying here. If anyone has any clarifications, please feel free to, to add them here. Um, the next is SUSARS to FDA. If they're fatal or life-threatening, they need to be reported as soon as possible and no later than seven calendar days after the sponsor first became uh, aware of the information. All other SUSARs need to be reported as soon as possible, no later than 15 calendar days, after the sponsor determines that the information qualifies for reporting. So uh, notice the difference that for the 15 calendar days, they actually get more time to actually think and investigate the information and make sure that it qualifies. Um, and then speaking of reporting to FDA, SUSARs are not the only thing that is required to be immediately reported to the FDA by the sponsor. Other information that would suggest that the drug uh, has increased risk that you didn't know about it before uh, should also be promptly reported to the FDA. Finding from other sources, such as other studies, ongoing or completed, um, pool data, animal or in vitro testing, even uh, increased occurrence of serious suspected adverse reactions. Uh, where the rate is more than you have uh, observed until now, those should be immediately reported as well by the sponsor to the FDA. How do you report? You use um, most people, and that, that's the most people. Um, the, the most common way to report is to use uh, FDA Form 3500A or MedWatch. It has all the relevant fields. It is most commonly what you see when you get those reports from the sponsor, uh, but the regulations allow for additional um, ways to report. You can submit a narrative format, you can submit electronic format, and you can use the foreign uh, equivalent of FDA form, CIO MS one form, um, and FDA will accept that one as well. We have a couple of questions in the chat. Do you want to wait uh, oh. uh, until the end of this uh, session, uh, to to go over those? No, questions? we can we can uh, we can break now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the first question uh, that I see is kind of going back to SUSAR uh, and uh, SAE. It says, uh, um, "Can you reinforce how reporting requirements differ between SAE and SUSAR?" Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, where did I go? Reporting requirements. It's uh, probably a few slides back. Yeah. SAEs and SUSARs? 
yes, the reporting requirements uh, between SAE and SUSAR. How do they differ? So, well, SAEs, uh, I think you will see, I think I have a, um, um, I think I have a slide at the end that may answer to that. Uh, so I'm going to hold off on that. That's but in general, uh, SAEs are not an immediately reported event, immediately reportable event per the regulations uh, to the FDA. Uh, the sponsor is the one that needs to be in the regulations. The sponsor is the one that needs to be immediately made aware of those. And IRB is something, I will get to it. You know, I will get to it. I, I, I'm just uh, okay. confusing everyone right now. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So another question is uh, um, from Joanne. Uh, it says, if the a nurse practitioner is not involved as a PI or sub-PI or co-PI, then they cannot do these things. By these things, I believe, uh, Joanne, you can unmute yourself and mention what you mean by these things, but I believe for the reporting. Oh, no, sorry, not the reporting, the, 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 the uh, uh, determination. Would you like to unmute yourself? Okay, so we will jump to next question. It's maybe she's uh, she's not uh, she's not here now. Uh, next okay. question is: um, I believe the nurse practitioner can, as long as they are involved in this study or the PI, this 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 is me. Um, so it's kind of comment to Joanne's point, I guess. Okay. Um, okay, so we're talking about the delegation. Um, oh, that's the delegation. delegation. Um, okay. And I'm sorry if I didn't pause for questions there, maybe, so I apologize for that. Um, um, so maybe yeah. we should leave it to the end to get to the uh, to the questions that we didn't. There the is, questions. there is, yeah, uh, please clarify, because this, this sent directly to me, so, uh, please clarify, Stanford IRB guidance requires reporting of the unanticipated problems versus... versus okay, this is all coming. This is all coming. It's okay, all coming. Let's, let's just continue. Okay. Wonderful. You save okay. it all we for the... Yeah. Uh, so we did SUSARS to FDA. Now SUSARS to investigator. Uh, as soon as possible and no later than 15 calendar days after the sponsor determines that the information qualifies for reporting. This is similar, this is similar to SUSARS to FDA. SUSARS or USAR, um, which is suspected unexpected adverse reaction to the IRB. Those would meet the criteria for unanticipated problems involving risks to participants for others or UPs. Um, and as such, they would need to be promptly reported to the IRB. Uh, so as you can see, IRB has a wider um, range for reporting. So not just SUSARs would fall under uh, that UP category. And by prompt, uh, these are the timelines, unexpected deaths or life-threatening experiences should be reported within five working days from when the protocol director learns of the event, and all others should be reported within 10 working days from when the protocol director learns of the event. Now, the regulations actually only say promptly. They, should they do not define uh, the days. The days that you're seeing here are what comes, what comes from the Stanford IRB guidance. These are Stanford IRB timelines. When you're working with other IRBs, you, want, you need to check with uh, the applicable reviewing IRB for their accurate timeline. But it's not gonna be significantly different. It's gonna be within a week to two weeks, uh, those reporting timelines for all of them. Uh, I hope that answers the uh, IRB question. Uh, can you wait until you have all the information with these immediate reportings? Absolutely not. You have to report what you know by the required timeline and then you follow up with additional reports as more information becomes available. And this is my summary slide of immediate reporting. I am just gonna pause here for questions and let you take a look at it. And I hope that this answers most of your questions, but if not, then just 
uh, this is the time for them. Any questions? I just to clarify, Maya, we submit, once we get SUSARs from the sponsor, we submit those to the IRB in a report, not upon continuing review. That's correct. Because SUSARs would meet the, the uh, definition of the UP because they're uh, unexpected, they're related to study participation, as has been determined because it was reported to use a SUSAR, and they're harmful. So if they meet all, all, all of those three, they are a UP, and they need to be properly reported. Hey, Maya, uh, I may have missed this, but uh, can you clarify uh, the IND, IND reporting within seven or 15 days, 15 calendar days? Yeah, yeah. Seven, uh, seven days is for fatal or life-threatening. 15 calendar days is for all the rest. Got it. Okay, moving on. Next slide. Periodically reportable adverse events. Adverse events to sponsor, that would be per protocol. Uh, AEs, SAEs to FDA. Uh, in the annual report, you would submit a narrative or tabular summary showing the most frequent and most serious adverse events experienced by body systems. So that would cover uh, that. SAEs to IRB, I already um, shared. Most, most would just want to see it in continuing review, but again, some would want it uh, promptly reported and AEs to IRB in uh, continuing review as well. And now there are four scenarios. We will go over them one by one to sort of review this reporting scheme that we just covered. And then we're gonna move on to our case studies. And I see that Dr. Kuo Jones, uh, yeah, I see that she joined, so right on time. Uh, so yeah, we can start with the first scenario. You are the sponsor investigator in a study with a SUSAR that resulted in death. Which of the following steps should you complete? Okay, I think we can, can get slowed down. Um, so the correct response is you should complete all of them except for immediately report to the sponsor 
because you already are the sponsor. Um, all the rest, you need to immediately to collect all available supporting information as soon as possible. You need to submit a UP report to the IRB within five working days. Submit an IND safety report to FDA within seven calendar days. Report SUSAR to other sites if it's a multi-site um, study for, you, for which you are the sponsor investigator within 15 calendar days. And then follow up on this initial report as new information becomes available. Uh, and that's true for everyone. So, okay, that's interesting. Let's do the next one. You're the sponsor. Now you're the sponsor in a study with a SUSAR, uh, not death or life threatening. Which of the following steps should you complete? And again, it's multiple choice. I think we can stop. Oh, no, numbers are still oh, okay. Um, okay, so this is looking better. Uh, the two steps you should not be doing is, of course, report the SAE to yourself and submit a UP to the IRB because reporting to the IRB is the investigator or the sponsor investigator's responsibility, not the sponsor's responsibility. Uh, all the rest, yes, you should be doing that. So you should collect all available supporting information. Uh, you should submit an IND safety report to the FDA within, uh, oops, within 15 calendar days. <laughs> um, that was uh, my mistake. You should report SUSARs to other sites within 15 calendar days. And you should follow up on initial report as new information becomes available. Uh, let's go to the next question. You're the investigator in a study, and there was a SUSAR, not life threatening, <laughs> excuse me, in your site. Which of the following steps should you complete? Definitely use it for polls. Um, yeah, I think we can stop. Okay, so yeah, this is looking better. <laughs> You're getting it. Um, yeah, as the investigator, you would immediately report the SAE to the sponsor. You would collect all available supporting information. You would submit a UP to the IRB within 10 working days. Sorry, that is my fault. Um, you would not submit an IND safety report to FDA. That's the sponsor responsibility. And you would not report to SUSARS to other sites. That's the sponsor responsibility. But you would follow up on initial reports as new information becomes available. Um, and final, now to the final poll. Poll nine. Poll 10. 
you are the investigator in the study and you have received a suicide report from the sponsor. Which of the following steps should you complete? I think we can stop. I don't see the numbers going up. Uh, so it's 61 percent in. Um, yes, you would submit a UP report to the IRB within 10 working days, and you would follow up on initial reports as new information becomes available. So the third one and the last one are the winners. Okay. Um, I'm moving on to the case studies that Dr. Ko is going to present. Um, I already introduced you beforehand, but I'm, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm happy to introduce you again. Uh, Dr. Ko, uh, are there any questions before? Yes. Um, there is one question, Maya, before uh, we move uh, on to the case studies. Um, um, my apologies, Dr. Bolt. So, uh, it says uh, IRB guidance uh, has warning about reporting a deviation intended to eliminate an immediate hazard to the participants. Can you speak to that? I would rather not because it has nothing to do with address events. <laughs> um, so I would rather not. I would uh, rather you ask uh, IRB about that or clarify how how you you think this relates to, to address events. Okay, um, so thank you so much. Uh, um, again, Dr. Um, Paul uh, Co doesn't need introduction as Maya said. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Um, Co. Susan and Maya, thank us. you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, and uh, let's just go ahead and get started now. I think somebody else may have no one handed me control of the slides, so if you could just advance them, that would be just super. Okay, all right, very good. So here we have um, the punchline here. So these are all fictitious. So none of you will suspect that you're um, uh, hearing cases about that involve your own subjects and research. So let's go ahead and get started with the next one. Case one, so you're the sponsor investigator of a phase two double blind placebo controlled study of oral medicine X in subjects with a viral pneumonia. You have been informed by the research coordinator that a participant uh, has been hospitalized for treatment of hypotensive shock due to vomiting. Participant has been uh, hospitalized for three days and was discharged yesterday. So the question uh, then becomes for you, um, what are your next steps? Okay, so is this an adverse event? Do we have a poll or shall, are we going to do this by consensus, Maya? How would you like to do this? Uh, I don't, I, we didn't have a poll for this. It's just unmute or um, thumbs up or... Uh, <laughs> yeah, we can do any of those. Those are all very accurate data collection methods. Thumbs up. Thumbs up would be great. Um, in chat, they, it's coming in yes uh, as well. So they can okay, put it awesome. in the chats or thumbs up. Uh, yes, I, I, I actually see a proliferation of yeses. So I'm very, I'm very relieved of that. Okay, we, uh, good. Everybody paid attention to Maya. Okay, so uh, now let's go to the next. Is this an SAE? Okay, so why don't everybody just uh, in, the, in the chat, everybody just let, let us know your thoughts. And again, um, I, 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 happily, Maya, I, I see no no's. So that's, that's, a, that's a very good thing. So everybody agrees that uh, this is a 
yes, and uh, for a severe adverse event, right? They were hospitalized uh, and again, hypotensive shock. And then let's go to the next bullet. Is this life threatening? Okay. All right, I see one, I see a few proliferations of no's, okay? Um, would it, could somebody explain, um, could somebody speak up about why they think it's yes? And then I would just like it just to hear the thoughts about why someone would think that it is no. We, we lost consensus here. He's on mute and speak to it, please. Okay, somebody wrote, if there wasn't intervention, it would be life-threatening, okay? So, but uh, hypotensive shock uh, due to vomiting uh, is certainly great for, and it would therefore be, um, this would be a life-threatening uh, adverse event, okay? Uh, and it should be grade, uh, graded as such, okay? Now, is this unexpected? Okay, can everybody, so the answer is yes or no. Is this unexpected? And to clarify, what you're looking at is um, cuttings from the investigational brochure. Uh, right. Or excerpts. Right, so yeah, vomiting it, vomiting was present in in here, but uh, um, but um, we we also have from the protocol that no serious adverse uh, reactions were actually expected by the sponsor uh, for this in, in the cumulative summary tabulation SAEs, which uh, when when referring to these um, the the investigator brochure is often your friend, right? I mean, which is which is why. When we get these up, um, when we get these periodic updates to the investigator brochure, it's very important to go through through here. So this was actually so vomiting is not unexpected, but the severity uh, was clearly unexpected in this particular case. Okay. So next, um, is this related? Uh, this person who came in for three days in the hospital after taking study drug on day one, which subsequently, by the way, led to cessation of study drug. So is this, would you, would you classify this as, so what I see here are some definitive things like likely related, probably, um, and other things. So, uh, so we, hear a, we have a lot of likelies. Um, for, for the purposes of this exercise, um, and, and I realize when you're filling out your documentation that you can grade the likelihood of relationship, but I think here we're unfortunately not going to give you that option. Uh, it's just, uh, do you feel this is related? And uh, if it occurred immediately after taking the study drug on day one, um, I think we would all err on the side of just basically saying, yes, um, that this is actually going to be related, right? I mean, just, um, and so... Uh, particularly since it looks like um, after hospitalization, cessation of study drug, um, um, she continued the study drug while in the hospital and vomiting intensified and only stopped on uh, day four with cessation of study drug. So I, I think here we have a fairly definitive, um, we have a fairly definitive timeline, right? Fair? Okay. So, uh, so here, so um, what, so what we know about this one, okay? So uh, this is a um, keep going. This is an SAE, and it was unexpected, uh, and this will generate a SUSAR, okay? And um, <clears throat> the steps are shown here. So um, this, uh, you're the investigator. But um, or sponsor, but as you can see here, our tasks here are to collect all supporting information, uh, submit a um, 
UP report to the IRB. Again, Stanford, Stanford's SOP is that you would do this within five days and the IND the FDA within seven days. Um, and then the SUSAR would go out to investigators within 15 calendar days. And obviously, uh, as initial or additional data becomes available, you're going to uh, uh, be submitting this. And I think all of the coordinators, you've all seen, we get these emails uh, just with follow-ups on uh, AEs as additional information becomes available. Okay. Are there questions about this? It's a, it's a very useful exercise. Any questions? Okay. Okay, thank you. Can we go to the uh, next one? Okay. So you're the investigator of an industry-sponsored double-blind randomized placebo-controlled clinical trial to evaluate an investigational drug Y for the treatment of Pemphigus vulgaris, uh, which is a rather uh, devastating dermatologic disorder. Uh, the dosing and administration, you can see here, 100 milligrams daily for 15 months. There is a 68-year-old female who is diagnosed with a left breast cancer 15 months after uh, study treatment. Uh, so that, in other words, she's at the very tail end of the study, and she is unfortunately diagnosed with a breast carcinoma. So a couple of um, questions here. Um, so number one, uh, for everybody, we can just ask, is this uh, an SAE? Okay, not particularly controversial, right? I think, uh, okay. Is this an SAE? And then we have some um, important, um, and then we have some important uh, different other uh, outcome attributed to the adverse event, right? Yes, so the answer is yes, and why? Um, so, um, there will be a hospitalization to treat the breast cancer, and also it's obviously a serious or uh, important uh, medical event as well, right? And I think someone put it very nicely, requires intervention to prevent permanent damage. That's absolutely right. Okay. Very good. So is it expected? So here again, the investigator brochure is your friend and, and you have to, uh, here you have to have this readily available and you, you go through it and, or your um, PI is going through this. The PI is going through this with the coordinator. And so what you can see here is that uh, based on the current clinical, non-clinical experience with this drug and other drugs in this particular class, uh, there are potential risks and they include uh, amongst here a variety of hematologic and immune mediated effects, but um, one of them turns out to be malignancy and lymphoproliferative disorders. And, and so um, uh, that, that is uh, certainly a potential uh, uh, risk uh, in, in this particular study because of the class that this drug belongs to. However, Malignancy and lymphoproliferative disorders have not yet been uh, uh, have not yet been reported with this particular medicine or this particular study drug yet, drug Y. But that's actually a fairly common scenario. Uh, as all of you, particularly at Stanford, where we work with a variety of novel compounds, uh, if you're doing phase two studies or early stage, earlier stage studies, then oftentimes uh, we are the, if you will, the sentinel cohort or the canary in the coal mine that will, that will actually, um, actually detect these safety signals that we all need to pay attention to as we uh, bring novel therapeutics forward. So uh, th this is one that 
uh, we definitely need it, uh, that you definitely need to keep a close eye on. Let's go to the next. So um, this was, as you can see here, not expected because it was not um, reported on study drug Y. Okay, do you see? And um, the malignancy here, though, uh, was new. So um, let's go to the next one. So is it related? Okay. So uh, so let's put. The, so we have to look at some of the here the pros and cons here. Uh, so um, what do we have here? Distant family history of breast cancer. There's a uh, smoking history. Uh, there's a long-term uh, history of long-term estrogen treatment, uh, and then uh, the age of the subject. Uh, what goes for yes is um, con compatible temporal relationship with a study drug after 15 months. There was documentation of a normal mammogram last year. And again, we, as we said uh, on the previous slide from the investigator brochure, uh, with this particular class of medicines um, that uh, there are certainly malignancies are theoretically possible. Uh, again, just because it was early with this study drug, there was no, um, it had not yet been uh, reported. But again, uh, this, this is often what we see is that this is uh, something that uh, you will discover the safety signal uh, in the clinical trial itself. So, uh, so is this related? How are you going to grade this, or how is your PI or investigator going to grade this together when you sit down with them? And so the answer is yes. I, I agree with everybody who says that um, um, yes. And if we can have the next bullet point, I think we'll have it. Yeah. Uh, so there's a reasonable possibility of the contributory role of the study drug to the onset or progression of the reported event. And um, let's go look at the reporting steps here. So in particular here, it's, it's essential. So you're going to report the SAE to the sponsor. We go forward with collecting all available evidence and supporting information as quickly as possible. Um, you need to submit uh, um, a UP report um, to the IRB within 10 working days. Um, and so, um, or excuse me, the sponsor will uh, submit that within 10 working days. And the sponsor will also send out a SUSAR within 15 calendar days and then follow up on the reports. Okay, so um, the UP goes to the IRB, the IND safety report to the FDA will be taken care of uh, by the sponsor. And again, this is because in this particular case, you, in case two, we are not the sponsor, we are an investigator in a multi-center trial. Okay. And then obviously the investigator, as you get more information, you will, um, so thank you very much, Maya, you will obviously follow up on this. So now going back to this. So this led to changes to the investigator brochure so that uh, you can see that uh, it changed. So malignancy, lymphoproliferative disorders have not been reported in studies of drug Y. Um, then uh, as it turns out, and this is the importance of uh, collecting these and the uh, data safety monitoring board would obviously review these, but there were three reports of breast cancer reported in studies uh, with this particular drug in 2021. And, and that's obviously an important piece of information for everybody who conducts studies uh, with this particular therapy for Pemphigus to um, know as they uh, care for their patients who participate in this trial. And obviously, uh, if the drug moves forward to approval, that's something that we would have to know. Does that make everyone clear on everyone clear on this? And you will see new AEs. Um, one of the very first I did my most of my trials were in novel hepatitis C therapeutics, and I will tell you we used one of them. Uh, some of you may have used it it's like 14, 15 years ago, tilaprevir, uh, which in the early stage studies looked well tolerated, but then. Uh, when we started the larger phase two trial, there was a rash that occurred in about a third to, uh, um, of individuals, which led to a very rapid change in the um, 
led to a very rapid change in the investigative brochure, uh, as well as other protocol amendments to manage this. So uh, again, prompt reporting, um, as we go through these trials uh, um, together, these multi-center trials, as I like to say, it takes a village uh, to, for, uh, for everybody to uh, put these together. And, and again, the benefit of this is obviously that um, everybody, uh, all the sites will benefit from this if we do so. Okay, um, let's keep going then. Um, let's see here, the next one. So you're the investigator in an industry-sponsored double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial to evaluate investigational, investigational drug B for the treatment of influenza in adults over 65. Uh, dose administration, 25 PO twice a day for seven days. There's an 80-year-old male reported suicidal thoughts uh, during two weeks of follow-up. And um, let's see here. So thoughts started on day four of treatment, ended after about a week. No specific suicide plan was involved. So is this an adverse event? And here we have the common toxicity criteria scale here. Thank you very much for that, Maya. That's very subliminal and, and very, uh, very nice here. Uh, is this, so is, is this an adverse event, everybody? Good, everybody says yes, and we agree, absolutely, okay? Now, is this an SAE? Maya, all the, no, all the yeses are going to no, so they obviously paid attention. Very good. Um, and, and so uh, this is not an SAE, uh, but we, we do see this. So, uh, so what do we uh, put here? So the event was immediately reported to the IRB, but not the sponsor. Uh, and the reason for this is because of Stanford guidance. Uh, and this guidance is shown here. So uh, you report, uh, you report certain clinical events, and these include deviation intent to eliminate immediate hazard to a participant, such as suicide or suicide attempt or participant or other uh, mo um, monitoring visits, um, and a corrective action preventative action plan was implemented. Uh, the report only after consulting with your IRB uh, panel manager. So um, in this particular case, um, th this is not an SAE, but obviously uh, there we, do, we do see these. Um, for instance, in our own practice, uh, we deal with a variety of cytokines or uh, medicines such as interferon that um, also uh, can potentially have neuropsychiatric effects. And obviously, these are also adverse events of interest. Okay. Case four, you're the investigator in an industry-sponsored double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial to evaluate investigational drug T for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis in adults. Um, you can see here, it's a, a oral medicine, 50 milligrams daily for five months. Uh, there is a 55-year-old female who's enrolled in the study reports lateral chest pain for 24 hours, admitted to the ED with left rib pain, but without respiratory failure or hypoxemia. Uh, bilateral pulmonary emboli are diagnosed, and they, she is initiated after hospitalization on anticoagulants. The treatment is stopped, and she is recovered. Uh, she recovers and then is subsequently discharged from the hospital. Let's go to the next one. So the medical history and test did not provide any clear etiology for the pulmonary embolus. Three to four months earlier, the participant had upper respiratory symptoms with a cough uh, and a flu-like condition, and this might have corresponded uh, with uh, a COVID-19 at the time of the PE. Uh, the patient did have a positive IgG for COVID-19 with negative IgM, indicating that at some point she has had likely a uh, COVID, uh, uh, COVID exposure. Uh, the question, of course, was, um, was this actually related to a potential remote COVID exposure, or was it potentially more likely uh, to the initiation of the rheumatoid arthritis therapy that was initiated in the clinical trial? 
so just to um, just to uh, get everybody's um, in point. Oh, Maya, you jumped the gun. Uh, I was going to say um, <laughs> but, um, this is an SAE, right? She's hospitalized, PE, um, and the question is: um, uh, Is this expected by per the investigational brochure? And the answer is no. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, this is a very much a very real life um, situation with a study drug. Uh, where this safety signal was um, detected. So uh, th this was um, something that then, again, the research sites, coordinators and principal investigators had to determine, is this related to uh, study treatment? Um, and so um, the question is um, here, is it related to study treatment? Um, and the investigator thought it was uh, probable cause for the PE was the earlier infection with COVID because of the IgG. However, however, um, um, the sponsor very interestingly overruled the investigator saying the temporal association between COVID and PE was weak and um, notice and they what they said was that uh, the lack of conclusive evidence for an alternate or alternative etiology, the event of bilateral PE was assessed as related to the study blinded therapy. Okay, and so um, this is an example of a sponsor not following the FDA guidelines of only determining causality if there is evidence to suggest that the study, uh, that the drug caused the event. So how often, Maya, in our experience, have we had something like this? It's rare, right? It's pretty rare. Yeah, because yeah, really, this is interesting. yeah, because it's the investigate. Although, by the way, in this particular case, um, you know, we, we don't want to talk about specific drugs, but um, I, I, I don't. I mean, the I, I, this is not what the FDA guidance tells us to do. But there was merit to what the, I mean. The sponsor certainly. Um, uh, I mean, there is evidence that this could be also related to study drug as well. And in fact, there are, um, this is actually a very much a real life situation with RA drugs, just for the record. It's just complicated. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, if any questions throughout that you thought maybe Paul could provide a better answer, <laughs> this yeah. is the time to ask them. Yeah, uh, oh, so yeah, please feel free. <laughs> yeah, just for the record on this one, Maya, I would have called this one related to the study drug. But 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 it's not that but it is not for the it's not for the sponsor to decide. I mean, that's the investigator role. Oh, that's a cute picture. So please, everyone, um, unmute yourself and uh, ask uh, questions yeah. if you would like. There were a couple of questions in the chat uh, earlier on that Maya said it's going to be covered. So if your question is still not answered, please, uh, by all means, unmute yourself or put it in the chats. Uh, we still have uh, um, um, enough time to answer all your questions before the end of the session. And thank you so much, Paul and Maya. This was really wonderful and informative. So please unmute and ask your questions. Maya, I think you did, everything you did was so clear. Good for you. <laughs> yeah, I don't have any questions, but thank you to you both. This was very helpful and very informative. Yeah, does everyone partner with their PI about these as AEs, by the way? That's a very important aspect of this. Yes. Yes, 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 I, yes, we do. Thank you, Tina. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so if there is no question, we can uh, end it earlier and uh, give the rest of your time back. Um, Everyone gets so, 15 minutes. Yes, again, thank you so much, Paul and Maya. Um, oh, yeah, no. It was uh, really very informative. And, and, and Maya, uh, thank you very much for doing this. Really appreciate it. Yep. Yes, exactly. And it was very engaging uh, presentation, Maya. And thank you so much. You made, you made it so interactive uh, with the limits that Zoom puts forth for us. Yeah. So thank you so much. Uh, appreciate your time. Again, uh, for the participants, please uh, note that I will send out an evaluation and you have 30 days to complete that evaluation. And in, if you are requi requesting um, continuing education credit or BRN credit, please remember to, make, um, um, to uh, list your name in the evaluation. Otherwise, uh, it's anonymous. You don't have to put your name. But if you are requesting credit, we need to know your name. So thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Maya and Paul. And have a, a lovely rest of the day. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Maya, may I ask 